All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, people are still joining us, but I think we should get going. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, first of all, to welcome you all to our seminar, but it's a special pleasure to welcome Atambile, Dr. Atambile Masola, who uh, we, we, we were had, trying to get to present in the seminar for quite a while. <laughs> Um, please are reminded to mute yourselves upon entry. Um, and uh, so, Atimbile, thank you very much for for finding a gap in the end um, in your in your very busy schedule. Um, Atimbile is currently a well, she's fairly recently joined the Department of History or the Department of Historical Studies, I think it's called at UCT. And uh, Atambila, I think it, it's, in my view, is part of one of the most interesting historiographical trends in the field at the moment, um, which is the really exciting and growing field of black, what you might call black intellectual history. Uh, and uh, I think also an interest specifically in, in subjectivity, which I think is also clear in this paper, um, which I think is a really important trend in the field. And at the same time, um, she, she's, I think, making fabulous use, especially of uh, vernacular African language newspapers and the like. And uh, Atambile is a extremely versatile person because besides being uh, employed as a professional historian, she is also a poet who's recently published uh, a volume of poetry in Isiklosa. And uh, there are many other things, projects that she's involved in, including podcasts, um, some really interesting language projects. And so I just really want to thank you, Atimbile, for joining us today. And um, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, you. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, goodness. Um, I feel like I should start with some disclaimers because um, this is really a work in progress. Um, and it's not every day you come to a seminar and a lot of the people whose work you refer to and write about are in the room. So it's a work in progress. Um, so I'm going to read it um, as, yeah, I don't know how to do it because I did submit the, um, the, the chapter, well, the draft of whatever this might be, a chapter of something. Um, should I just read it? I, I think, no, actually, sorry, Atibila, clearly I'm, I'm out of practice from having holiday. Um, why don't you assume that it's been read by a core group of us and just give us a kind of speak to the paper, That's give us some introductory sense. remarks, maybe for 10, 15 minutes. And... Okay, cool. 10, 15 minutes. Okay, let me time myself. All right. Um, that's great. Then I'll just speak to it and maybe I'll kind of speak to the story behind the, the, the story, um, or the story behind the paper rather. Um, so this is a long-term project that I'm hoping will be a book. Um, and this is kind of like the preliminary um, stages of it because I, in, when I started writing this, it was off the back of a longer course that I'm also teaching, which I happen to be teaching tomorrow again, um, about gendering the Black transnational. So I'm interested in South African women at the moment and their journeys. And so the course, as I was planning it, all this, and which is, I, I kind of framed it as I would a book in a sense, uh, or how I imagined a, a book or a manuscript would unfold, is um, I was starting in the 1930s. But as I was preparing for that, I found myself um, going further and further back. It made sense to go further and further back. And it was actually conversations with Joe, whose work I use, um, and finding the, the collection of. Um, Jane Waterston's letters that Elizabeth put together um, that helped me kind of think, well, even though I, my kind of framing often begins in, oh, I forgot to close the door, um, in the 1920s and 30s, it just made sense to go further and further back. But the challenge with that was where to find these women. Um, and so the footnotes is basically where I began looking, footnotes, reports, pictures and it was actually while preparing for this course last year and going back to Lynn Thomas's work that I began to, I mean, I reread the paper and it was the first time like Dal Cecil got jumped at me. Which, um, I'm getting an echo. Okay, there you go. Um, and then kind of led me to think, well, why hadn't I noticed her before? So it was also just a, a way for me to think about the things that I hadn't noticed before even while I'd been doing this work um, 
for about three or four years already, and kind of the, the importance of rereading work, in fact. Um, so yeah, that's where I start with the footnotes. And um, I had a presentation, actually, so maybe that might help um, so that I don't waffle too much. I hope it's open somewhere. Oh, goodness, it's not. Yes, it's open here. Um, Sorry, I can't now find it. And you're going to see now. You would think after all these months and months of doing Zoom, we would be able to find what we're looking for. Oh, gosh. Let me try again. Ah, there we go. So maybe I'll just show the images um, that I referred to in the paper. Um, I hope you can see that. Um, so this is the image that I was referring to in, in the paper, the image of Dao Sesoka. And while Lynn kind of speaks to the context around it and the importance of portraiture, for me, it was quite interesting to just read the image. How do we read um, Dao Sesoka as a subject? How do we read the clothes that she's wearing? How do we read her posture, the hairstyle? Um, and what does it tell us about this young woman um, who is in a foreign country, um, who is in love with somebody else, who is kind of an unrequited love story um, that Joe helped me piece together. Um, and so I'm quite interested in the details and the kind of granular details of the images. Um, and then um, because I'm using multiple texts to kind of, and I think also the other important choices that I'm struggling with is do I write this as I find the images or do I write this chronologically as the pieces kind of unfold chronologically. And that's a decision that I've been struggling with. Um, but when I looked in Isikidimi Samakosa, it was quite interesting for me to find um, the Mpanga, the, the death notice. And so it became quite significant that I find an image and then I find an, a, a notice of the death quite immediately. And I'm also interested in what happens when these women die young. Um, because for a lot of the women that we end up writing about, the fact that they they write themselves in because they've had the benefit of time to to write their histories or to write their stories, or we find letters or we find reports. For someone like Dao Sesok and a few of the other women, we don't have that benefit. Um, and so, yeah, the, the the kind of finding her death and finding the name of her father, but not finding the name of her mother, is then um, kind of begs more questions about how easy it is for women and their mothers to kind of fall through the cracks. Um, and then this um, came much later, even though chronologically um, this article appears earlier. Um, and again, it kind of confirmed the, the names, more names of the women, because up until this point, I hadn't found the name of Letitia and Lenny until um, I found um, the Jane Waterston's letters. So yeah, it's, it's a question of timeline. And I guess I, I, the, 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 the chaos that I refer to um, is because of this concern with the timeline um, and how to, and, and I know historians, I'm a literary historian, um, and I know historians are quite particular about timelines, but I think I'm, I'm leaning towards the chaos of the archive to show the difficulty of how it is to piece together um, some of this information rather than organizing it and making it appear as though the story is chronological. Um, and I don't know, maybe that, that's something that we I'd like some thinking around and in, in, in those decisions. Um, and then the kind of first instance of finding the school records was really interesting for me when I went to Cory Library and looked up um, the Labdale Girls School um, records. Um, and again, what's interesting is finding the names of where people come from, um, the, the, the places where people come from, and it adds another layer to how we tell these stories. Um, and again, the, the names that were new in, in this list were Sanam Zimba, Martha Kwacha, and again, Daose is, is there, and the other woman um, who kind of appears names but have very little context. And part of the other the type of context with these women is that if they don't marry prominent men, they also disappear. So Martha Kwacha, um, I think marries um, Pambani Nzimba, Letitia Nleni marries um, John Knox Bokwe. And so one way or the other, their names kind of live on because they're constantly being introduced as the wife of so-and-so. 
But again, for those who die young or those who don't marry, that kind of um, that kind of, of 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 longevity to a name doesn't quite um, doesn't quite remain the same. And in the paper, I'm also trying to frame um, kind of the early early girls' education um, that is beautifully mapped out in the letters, um, or troublingly mapped out in the letters, um, in terms of to give a life world of what it meant to appear on the list um, and appear in reports and um, what it means um, to, to kind of be an infant school teacher like Sanam Zimba was or in, be in the school department or work department like Martha Kwacha and um, Margaret Majiza were. Um, and then I guess it was a bit of a weird thing, but I wanted to list, I list all the, the footnotes and the way that they are written, particularly in Jane Waterston's um, uh, this is a picture of um, Leticia and Mone as it is found in the, the book that I, I mentioned and showed earlier. Um, but I, I also list the, 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 the footnotes as, they, as, as Elizabeth uses them in the, in the collection because it is so interesting. So um, the kind of the, how women are, relate, are written in relation to the, the, the fathers or the uncles or the, the husbands. Um, and the years in which they are in, in, in each of the schools. Um, and also the kind of the strange intimacies of what happens in these schools. So the relationship um, of what it means to be in service in the steward's house. Um, and I think there's a, a, there's a, a kind of a real undercurrent of how we think about those intimacies and what does it mean for these women to travel with the stewards abroad? What happens while they're on those journeys? I mean, that's, largely open for speculation but I'm, I think the another layer of this research is thinking about those those intimacies which I'm referring to them as intimacies because it, it seems quite um, obvious to me if someone's going to be working in someone's house traveling with somebody um, kind of taking on this life world of these missionaries there is a, a proximity there that we often think of in power dynamics but I'm also um, in conversation with people who are thinking about it as intimacies um, and what those intimacies might mean. And maybe we could spend some time talking about that as well. Um, and then maybe the last image that I find the most interesting, um, again, as it appears in the collection of letters, and the part that's really the most, you know, jarring, the women are un unidentified. Um, and what does it mean when we're constantly reproducing this narrative of the women are unidentified? And in the paper, or oh, this chapter, it's like, trying to with the information that we have if we've got the list and we've got this image well how do we then pair names with the images um, and to kind of humanize the people in these images so the only person so far that i've been man that i've managed to identify because we've already got quite a distinct picture is Dawa Soga in this image and the challenge would be and i don't know maybe i haven't come across um, a text that has identified all the women in this um in this image, and it, it is such an iconic image. And then the only woman who is mentioned um, by name is um, Jane Waterston, right? The teacher. So again, what does it mean for us to constantly reinscribe the the the, the erasure of names? So even when we've got pictures, we still don't have names, um, or when we have names, we don't have pictures. Um, and what does it mean to write a more humanizing history of these women? Um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there, Stephen. I don't know if you'd like me to add anything to this thing as I'm assuming it as read. No, that, that's great, Asimbile, because I think people will, open, as we go for questions, um, we'll get going and you'll be able to open up more for us. So the usual process applies. Please uh, raise your hand, uh, virtually at least. Um, but you can also type uh, any messages or questions in the chat, of course. Um, so I'm looking for questions. Who'd like to get us going? Well, I'll start us off, I suppose, um, just in, in the meantime, while people are warming up. Um, so I suppose, I think one of my questions is about, I mean, actually, I just want to, I want to read the book um, um, because I think you, you whetted our appetite very nicely in, in this piece. Um, so I suppose, 
I, I was wondering about the kind of larger question of, of what the, the challenges of, um, for want of a better word, recovery are in this kind of project. And of course, in general uh, projects, you know, social historians, of course, have been, have been claiming to sort of reco recover the experiences and lives of, um, of ordinary people for many decades. And that, that process is kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's fraught in many ways and, and full of kind of paradoxes and difficulties, of course. Um, and I, so I suppose I'm, I'm curious about what, as you completed the project of which is, this is a part, um, or it's an ongoing project, I, I realize, um, but like it, sources, you're dealing with traces, uh, people who, um, partly for reasons of gender, but also because of, uh, and race, of course, but also because of uh, the trace they didn't uh, leave behind or that were not preserved in archives, etc., are harder to kind of reconstruct in terms of their, their imprints on history. Could you just say more about um, what you're finding, if you like, open the curtain a little more wide for us. Um, and I, I see that we are starting to get some questions. So if you just say more, it's one of those, please say more, and then we'll take some more questions. Yeah, uh, would you like me to take the other two as well, or just respond? As I think, why don't you, for now, let's go one, one by one. And then one by one, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, the challenges are many. Um, and I think it's because I come from, literature if i had found one or two texts i think half the book would be done by now but because i find myself like in the company of historians one way or the other is that there's this um anxiety about finding more and more and more sources um in spite of the fact that i'm finding more of the men than i am of the women which we know how that happens so i guess it's the it's the it's the the, um, the number of things I can find, but also with that, it's just like the practical stuff, knowing where to look, like the intuition of the archive. I think like a afterword of this book or like, I don't know, maybe a blog post I want to write is the intuition of the archive, knowing where to look when you don't know what you're looking for or knowing what to ask for. So for example, when I went to Cory Library, there was like a bit of an am and an ah, when I was trying to convince the person um, um, that I wanted to see something, I was like, I'm sure there are reports around this time, and this is what they probably look like. They're on your OPEC, but like just kind of sitting there painstakingly waiting to see something or waiting to find something and the excitement of that. But some of that is just purely intuitive about knowing or trusting that if I go to this source, I'm going to find something or even making the connection. So, for example, I think I'd already, I'd already about um Zazefesi Risoka. But until I saw the obituary, well, not the obituary, the death notice in the newspaper, I didn't know that it was Dawes's father. And I don't know if I will ever find the name of her mother, for example, because I'm quite invested in finding as much. And that's why it's not a biography as well. So that's why I'm not framing it in this timeline thing because I'm I know I'm gonna run into so many problems. Otherwise you'll never write because of all these gaps. Um, so that's the challenge of kind of knowing when to make peace with the fact that I can still write something even though I may not find all the information um, and then kind of having to do all these disclaimers all along the way, which is really frustrating. But that's a particular kind of framing or book in the sense because there are all these gaps. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm familiar. Um, so I've got a couple of hands coming now. So Busi. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for allowing me. And hi, Atembile. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with us. I think your work is very much uh, relevant to my studies and what I'm trying to do with my PhD um, research. And I, I, I want you or I would like for you to please speak a little bit more about the preoccupation with finding right in the archive especially when you are like the pictures you're showing um saying there might be a name but not a picture or a picture and not a name right 
And I think with me, um, I'm trying to find <laughs> Black women who worked in social research, right? So who were research assistants of perhaps more prominent um, anthropologists, scholars, historians, sociologists of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for instance, if you're thinking of such great work that was done by um, Belinda Pazoli and Mantu Ngozwe in uh, Women of Pukeng, but I, I can't find her. I don't know if that makes sense. And it's like, I've, I'm trying to deal with that for us. I don't know if it's a frustration, right? Or, or thinking about ways in which I can problematize this and express this in my thesis as finding them. I, I'm not finding them. I'm not sure if I'm making, you know, sense with this. So I don't know, how, are you feeling any sense of frustration with this? And are you planning on writing about it as a problem um, instead of, you know, being focused on coming up with a, a book of women that were found? I don't know if that makes sense. Wow. So, yeah, I, just, I wondered if you'd speak a little bit more to that because um, I, I am grappling with it. Um, and, yeah, just... In addition to that, maybe if you can mention the book, I, I know with your PhD, um, you do have a book that you're working on, on Noni Jabavu's writings. I'm not sure if that's out. So maybe if you can speak um, a little bit more to that. And also just the, the experience of finding her work as opposed to these women that, um, you know, are nameless to say you know um yeah if you could speak a little bit more to that as well thank you so much cool um thank you musi and your research sounds absolutely fascinating um yeah this obsession with finding you know um and i think it's a question of finding ways so uh, some people are making the distinction between like the colonial archive and that's usually our leaning towards when we're finding because things are stored in a particular way, they're at quarry, they're the historical papers, they're in places. Um, but what of the women who are not um, findable? What of the women who are um, not even in the footnotes, who are deliberately erased? Um, I'm thinking even of someone like Mina Soka and her relationship with, um, oh my gosh, I can see her, the cover of her book, but I can't, the anthropologist who did um, research in the Eastern Cape, but who had worked with Minasoga, Minasoga had been... Monica um, Hunter. Yes, Monica Hunter, Monica Wilson. So that relationship, you know, and kind of Minasoga um, appears tangentially. Um, and on the one, again, I guess it goes back to the question of intuition, and sometimes I'm also finding serendipity, um, is that and I don't want to get too esoteric, but like when these women want to be found, you will find something. I'm also kind of relying on those links, whether it's the footnotes or whether it's somebody passing something onto you or whether it's, um, you know, a, a, a name in a letter. Um, so I'm not thinking of it as a problem yet, but I think it's part of just the journey. And when you just write about the journeys of the work that we're doing, um, it's also about where are we looking? And I think a lot of this, um, someone like Noni Jababu, for example, it was where are we looking and someone as prolific as Noni Jababu, I think for me has been the lesson of you can be so prolific, you can be in images, you can write yourself in, but you can still get forgotten or get left up or get deliberately removed from records. So um, that was my journey with Noni Jababu was finding out that she had written in a newspaper and had written all these columns, but was not like a general knowledge kind of person in my world view or in my world sense growing up, even though I grew up in the Eastern Cape. Um, and then it was only when I like started turning my gaze or changing my gaze and becoming really interested in old books that I found the Oka people and drawn in color. So it's also about like looking really, really closely at boxes, at places that you wouldn't ordinarily look at. Um, and maybe the, the book that you're talking about is still kind of a work, in, not a work in progress, we're just waiting on some technicalities. 
Um, but the book that is out, and just a PSA, the launch is happening on Thursday, this Press, the foundational writer's book, it's too far for me to pull up, but that's happening on Thursday if people want to attend. Um, it's the book about Noni Jababu, Peter Abrams, the Centenarians, Eskian Patele, and um, Smusi Zanyembezi, and there I write a chapter about this ambiguous relationship with being found or being seen and unseen, Ukbon and Ukunga Bonwa, um, and how it's a constant negotiation, even for the woman, whether who they are assistants or they are prolific or they are the students or they are the helpers who are there, but are made to be as though they're not there. Um, and I think there's something very particular about black women because for such a long time, they've been infantilized in history. So the fact that someone is an assistant, it's okay for them to kind of fall off the record. Or the fact that someone is a helper in the case of the dish and then she's just a helper in the steward household and therefore is not, um, Kind of worthy of writing about so it's also like where are we looking in terms of my meaning has also just been the public lives of women but how do we also write about the private lives of women where they are actually very visible um and some of that we also find in 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 in, in novels like uh, i'm thinking of victoria swat boys um umandisa which is a a, a, a a, a fictional story about typically one of these women who would have been who would have gone to the missionary schools but she fictionalizes this life of like this perfect colonial subject who goes to school it's like a buildings romance almost so maybe literature is also a place where we can look to see where and how stories were written and, and published and victoria Swart boy's book for me kind of does that it, 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 it was published in 1934 and it kind of opens a window into another world of a black young woman who isn't necessarily written about in history, but here's this fictional story that's being written about her. So that's some of the, yeah, it is a problem, but I think it's a problem that we can overcome depending on how we engage the archive, which archive we're engaging. And I guess a bit of what like Sadia Hartman does in terms of how do we fill in the gaps? How do you read a grain against the grain? How do you read in between the lines? How do you, um, take some liberties maybe with like the, the the imaginative stuff you know kind of putting ourselves back in that time to have a sense of where would where would these women have written about themselves and because letters aren't recorded you know or, or black women's letters aren't recorded in spite of the fact that they were so prolific so you know Noni Jababu writes about her aunt Daisy Stop Mike, shouting, for God's sake. um Joe please mute um, That's, so, all right yeah the um, being uh, a prolific letter writer, but we don't have a collection of Daisy Magiwana's letters in this format, you know. So it's also those interventions that we then need to imagine what that would have been like. Thank you, Atabile. Please a reminder to remain muted. Um, I don't have the highest security settings on because that, that tends to be rather more antisocial, but it does require us to try. Uh, remain muted if we're not asking a question. We have a nice um, list of of uh, people who want to ask questions and some comments in the chat. I simply I will also forward you the 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 archive of the chat. Um, so I have a list with uh, Mareka, Joe, Nafisa, Elizabeth, and actually Shireen had her hand up. Shireen, do you want to come in here very briefly? I know your hand disappeared. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks so much, Atambile. I'm really, uh, you know, uh, I've been following what you've been doing for a while, and I think this is really exciting. It was, I was thinking about the historiography, um, the feminist historiography um, in a more global sense as I was listening to you, because this whole uh, idea of recovery has been so, um, uh, it's been rendered as if it were a simplistic question. And it seems to me really important, the kind of work that we are doing here, um, that that recovery is not, is not simply um, adding women and stir, right? So, so there's something about this uh, project that you and other people are, are doing um, that feels like it can speak back uh, to the kind of uh, debates in feminist historiography writ large. Uh, Stephen and I organized that biography workshop some time ago, and I remember being very struck by Carolyn uh, 
Friedman, uh, Steedman, just dismissing uh, recovery as a as a kind of, you know, and this is not really what we should be doing. We should not be writing um, biography in the sense uh, of reconstructing lives because of the impossibility of reconstructing lives. Of course, she's right in a sense, but what what she misses, uh, what she missed, I thought. And I think what um, the feminist historiography from uh, from the US uh, and the UK misses a little bit um, is exactly what you're talking about, which is capturing uh, uh, you know lives that were rendered so invisible uh, 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 for whom we, we you know we we can barely begin to to speak about. Um, and that picture is such a moving. Uh, demonstration of it, you know, where the men are named and not the women. Anyway, so I just wanted to say, I think you, you could, you know, you could also consider um, in your, in, in writing this historiography, I think you could consider writing back also to the Northern scholarship, um, which, which kind of has, has turned this genre of writing into something that's really uninteresting. And it's not. <laughs> Do you want to take that as a comment and we can get some more questions, I think, Bina? Yeah, thanks, Shereen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Um, Reka. Hi, I hope the, I don't have too much background noise. There's some kind of animal action going on in my house, which I'm trying to keep out of my room. Um, so the the question I have, I, I've I found the, this introduction very stimulating and, um, oh, sorry, just a moment. I just need to say that. I think it's an animal intervention. <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. Um, so um, I, I was intrigued by the tension between the the um, the, the thread in your both in the paper in the introduction and in your presentation about the archive as chaotic and the and then the what I myself read as um, maybe a little bit of tension with the idea of the the chaos of the archive and the um, theme of deliberate erasure of of young black women. And, and so I wanted to just um, ask about the forms of chaos that interest you and, and that particularly impact on your project. Um, you know, disorganization of archives, or I'm not sure exactly what 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 range of it I can think of various iterations of chaos that I've encountered myself. Uh, but what do you have in mind? And then um, the other thing that I, and part of the reason that I was thinking about this is um, in my own attempts to work in um, in African, uh, to analyze material from African newspapers on the one hand, and then thinking about, you know, fragments um, about particular lives that I might encounter in other archival contexts. Um, it's been very interesting to interesting and challenging to sort of try and work with accidental juxtapositions um, as you know almost suggesting possible ways of writing about an image that floats floats in a set of other documents, for example, or a, a sort of a fragment of prose. And on the one hand, and then, then also, um, I, I think, um, again, um, thinking about my own efforts to 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 write about the way in which um, women are referenced in another newspaper, Ilanga, that's in Atoll. Um, I tend to make use of sort of what else appears on the page, um, you know. So sort of say, if there's a little fragment of obituary to read it alongside um, the, the other kinds of material but but I, I, I want I'm 
thinking about you know the, the kind of range of strategies that, that one might use. So it's part comment, part question about um, those specifics of your research. Thanks, Tarika. Um, yeah, I guess the, the chaos that I'm thinking about, um, sorry, my window's open, um, is that often when we kind of think of like the James Stewart archive or the Labdale archive or who's the other, um, the kind of the, 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 the big names, of the Gray collection, there's the sense that there are certain archives that are organized in boxes or people have organized them over time. Um, and when we're looking for these women, they are, I mean, there's no noni jababu box or, you know, repository that you can go in and pick up and, and, and look through. And that's obviously still something that's in a, a work in progress when certain people do the work long term and then start to organize. So it's almost as if the more we become interested in people, the more organized the archive becomes in response to our need to organize those, those boxes. And so I guess that's the kind of disorganization I'm talking about is that you have to piece something from this full report. Um, so for example, um, Dollar Academy, um, where Dawuse and Dina Tanzana go to, that's in another country. So also it's just not disorganized, but it's disparate maybe, or it's chaotic in terms of also geographic location when we're thinking about transnational um, journeys. Um, and how do you, how do you kind of bring that together to make it easier for somebody to see something? So it's impossible for me to see something until someone like Joe says, no, it wasn't um, at this um, seminary, they went to Dollar and then I can contact Dollar and then they, they give me something that confirms that, but the Dollar records are not in South Africa. Um, so that's the one kind of way I'm, I'm thinking about the chaos. And maybe I, 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 the, 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 the framing of it as chaos is not helpful because it's maybe just, um, the nature of a dispersed archive um, rather than a chaotic or, or, disparate, or disorganized archive. But I'm also thinking of, like, I mean, this is organized, you know, it's day, it's, it's dated, it's chronological. It's, so how is it that something like this can exist, but other people's letters don't exist? So I guess I'm sitting with that, that tension. Um, and I love this idea of accidental juxtapositions, and I've been doing more and more of that. In fact, I was talking to someone today about Nonsism Goethe's poems that appear as a book, but when they first appeared, they appeared in newspapers, and how much we miss when also things are organized. Um, so going back to the original newspapers and looking, and that's why it was so great to find that, um, that death notice in the context of the full page. Um, and, 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 and of writing a fragment in response to that is another way of responding to the archive. So in something that I submitted um, for a, another book project is I had pictures um, and I had used the pictures in class and I was reflecting on this process of using these images in class. Um, and as a way to respond to them, I, I did creative writing. I wrote a letter to the people who are in, um, who are in this, um, who are in these images as a way to kind of frame the trouble with only finding images and using images. So creative writing I found has been a way that helps. And it, it, now more and more I'm finding that people, we, we, we're getting more and more better at accepting that that is also a form of intellectual engagement with some of this. Um, so uh, responding in prose to something. Um, so, the, and, and it's very experimental and it also depends on what publication, um, who's going to accept it and all the kind of rules we put in place for what is acceptable when we are doing this kind of work. But I'm finding creative writing, even if I just find a name or if I find a picture or if I find, um, you know, a um, yeah, it, it, there's a myriad of, of, of responses that you can have just based on one item. And um, yeah, I mean, it could almost just be like, uh, a response to just a footnote, you know, and so it, it's about that kind of level of engagement and investment we have in that process of um, responding to some of these fragments. Thank you, Asimbile. I think actually now is a good time to cup to to bundle uh, the three questions which are uh, up next. So we'll start with Joe, then Nafisa, and Elizabeth. Joe. Hi, everybody. Um, 
Hi, Atom Ville, and greetings from London, where it is a semi sunny afternoon. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the car waiting for my husband, who's in the dentist. Um, and it's such a pleasure to join you and to listen to you and to just hear everything. The question that I wanted to just respond to was the issue of um, that Atom Ville that you raised about chronology and how do you. Um, write a story that is um, a detective story as if you are still detectiving or do you have to tell the story as you have it like as a report for the magistrate or whatever uh, later like a whole monolithic story and um, just to say that I tried to write the discovery of Jesse Margaret Sorga, Tio Sorga's youngest daughter in that way and I thought that I'd done it perfectly. I, I co-wrote the paper with um, another man called Ian McCracken. And the two of us worked so carefully to show how we found one clue. And then well, Ian found the first clue. And then he approached me and we did something else. And then we moved to another place. And when it came to publication, they said, no, you have to go from zero to 100. And we had to rewrite it. And I would have much preferred it to to be that sort of stumbly, wandering, quandary, uh, false ends, loose ends, dead ends, and then breakthrough and so on. Um, and so I, I personally feel that the way that is the best way is that sort of excitement and the questioning, like the questions, the intellectual questions you have to ask in order to make the breakthrough, I think are more important than the breakthrough itself in a weird way, because they will lead other people to understand how to push back the walls and the barriers to find a new pieces of information, which I promise you are there. Thank you, Joe. So let's just, let's hear what Nafisa and Elizabeth have to say as well. Nafisa? Oh, hello, everybody. Extremely interesting. Um, Nafisa, your signal's not great. Uh, just try again. Not really, no. Not great. Um, shall, I it, shall I put it, shall I, is that better? Is that no, it's not okay. good. Well, Maybe I'll try again shortly. The... Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth? Hello there. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I feel as if this is a voice out of the deep past. Uh, when I edited the Jane Waterson letters, they simply fell into my lap in a situation where I knew nothing about Lovedale or Jane Waterston or a whole lot of other things. I just recognized that these were really interesting letters. Um, and so I was left with a whole lot of unanswered questions, particularly about the women that she was teaching at Lovedale. But as time goes on, those names linger in one's memory. And very much more recently, some of those names have cropped up again. Um, so well, really what I have is a couple of suggestions about where one might follow through, because these are not ordinary women. Um, they're women with education uh, and they're women with initiative. Um, I've recently been doing work with other people on the ICU, the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. And the ICU was different in the 1920s, for instance, from the ANC in that it had a very active uh, uh, membership, female membership, and also a very active rural membership. Uh, and I think that you might find some of these women cropping up in those records. I can pass on to you um, some people to contact who would know much more about this than I, but Sylvia Neem, for instance, wrote a lot about the ICU, and Helen Bradford wrote about the ICU in the rural areas, and both of those might be helpful. So I think um, to find these women, um, one needs to perhaps to come in from directions one doesn't normally think about. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's the, and also just very briefly, I'm 
don't know if you're aware of a volume called Lovedale Past and Present, but it was a volume that was produced at the end of the 19th century by the Lovedale people in response to the hostility, particularly from Afrikaners, about money spent on African education at the Cape. And so they put this book together as a series of biographies about the achievements of Lovedale students. Uh, there aren't a lot of copies, but there are a few around, and you might find something there as well. But I think it's the ICU and those sorts of activities where you might find more. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Elizabeth. So uh, we still have some more questions coming, but why don't you uh, go for that for now, Atembile? Cool. Thanks. And um, thanks, Elizabeth, for those um, uh, connection points. Um, and I know I emailed you, I think it was last year. I think I started working on this in 2020, actually, and then kind of forgot about it and resuscitated it recently for the conference. So I will definitely follow up. Um, and thanks for those names. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think one of the biggest frustrations is that kind of rural urban um, distinction. Um, and that trade unions will probably have like a better, more organized or valued um, traces. But women, so someone like um, Noni Chababu's mother, Florence um, Magiwane, who worked in the, the, the Zendele group, and I know um, Catherine Higgs and a few others have written about that. There isn't like an archive that you can just go and find information about the Zendele clubs, you know, where some of these women would have worked and would have done really, really important work. So yeah, it, 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 and maybe those will be in our mothers or our grandmothers or great grandmothers' hymn books and Bibles or you know family um, kiss or you know the, the, and then they were in pamphlet size. So when I've gone and looked in certain archives, it's just like it's these thin documents that could easily have been discarded. So I think it's also yeah, it's a matter of going back and back. And thanks for the Lovedale Past and Present. I'll I'll definitely follow up on that. Um, Joel, the, the obsession with coherence, and I think Nafisa was also making a, a, a comment about it as well. I think pub the problem with publishers is this, they think that people want coherence, and perhaps it's us pushing back and saying, but this is the kind of book that is emerging, and this is the kind of book that we need to write so that we can get closer to showing how a lack of coherence is where some of the, the interesting stuff is. So. One of the things that I, I hope to do in, as I'm writing this is push back on that with publishers um, and make an argument for a lack of coherence. Um, because I, that, I'm also just not that kind of, like I don't think that way. So some of the ways in which I've written already doesn't um, lend itself to coherence. I like snapshots as well. And maybe that's because of my kind of the, the my interest in memoirs. Um, I enjoy snapshots. So a lot of the, the stuff that I'm, I'm working on will probably end up being snapshots. Sometimes I even teach that way. So yeah, it's, it's a work in progress, I think, for all of us and getting publishers on board about those approaches. So uh, Shireen wants to come in on this particular point, then we'll try Nafisa again, and then I have Natasha and Pamela. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, one of the points I wanted to make um, actually is relevant here, which is that you know, there's a lot of virtuous writing on women, women's contribution to political movements, to labor movements and so on. And really what we want is the chaos and the disorder from a feminist point of view, because in the chaos and the disorder and the women behaving badly is where we will see the full complexity of these relationships. And I really think that, you know, Atta, one of your, your big... Um, uh, strengths here is your uh, hopefully your ability to access uh, the non-English archives, right? The archives that are in other languages and uh, using also your your literary scholarship skills in the songs and the poetry and so on, the places where women are not behaving well and joining movements and leading and so on, but but are unhappy and are, are fretful and are quarrelsome and so on. And, and for me, that is what is, you know, the feminist part of this project. Um, so how you get outside of that is a very hard uh, thing to do. But I think this detective work is so important. 
So uh, does he want to respond to that directly or should we take, let's take the last, these, this last bundle of questions. So if he wants to try again, then Natasha and Pamela and then Atembile, you can try and put it all together for us. Nafisa? Uh, hi, is that any better than last time? Somewhat, yes. Okay, well, then I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm just listening to this conversation. It seems to me that we're caught a little bit between the need for a biographical narrative in some form and there's these kinds of fragmentary methods bequeathed by postcolonial studies. And I think that that maybe it's time to for someone even more perhaps voiced from the past year than uh, Elizabeth van Eningen. And to say that, um, well, I was once told by a very old grumpy historian that um, there are no archival silences, um, only lazy historians. Um, and I have to say, uh, of course, it was an exaggeration and it was meant to teach me something. But the, um, you know what struck me? What struck me is that we've not talked about the photographs which you showed. And I was reminded of Lorena Rezzo's uh, photography and history in, in colonial Southern Africa. It's a really rich study and it's about the relationship between photography and the way in which photog photographic images sort of cut across these different kinds of boundaries and distinctions we're talking about, the public and the private, the colonial and the vernacular, the subject and the, all of this stuff. And it's, it's very detailed and the kinds of things in it that are really interesting. I mean, she was more interested in the 1920s and 30s, but you know, a lot of women and men who applied to travel, you had to travel, you needed to produce pictures. And a lot of those were studio pictures, you know? And so what do we know about the pictures? What do we know about when they were taken? What do we know about who took them? Studio photographers were incredibly uh, important in creating not just images of empire, but entire narratives about, uh, you know, mobility and race and, and subjecthood and all of that in empire. And, you know, I'm, when people say reading against the grain, I'm like, like, let's first read with the grain. How about that? Let's read with the grain. Let's just take like every source and do what, uh, well, well, Jeff Guy took me on my first ever, unfortunately, uh, a trip to the archives and then would one document spend three hours tracing it back through the colonial archive, which was an immensely useful, if extremely um, tiresome exercise. But that's what archival work is. Um, and we find the things sort of in between. Sometimes just asking the questions we're trained to ask gives us far more information uh, than we want. We've all become slightly sort of ADD archivists. And so I'm thinking, how about we just take what we have and try to like maximally contextualize it, find all of its layers, all the people, everything involved in the production of the archive. We're obsessed with the production of the archive and the production of history. Let's do it. So okay. I'm gonna leave Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get uh, Natasha and Pamela. Natasha. Um, hi everyone. Let me just angle my uh, computer so that people aren't slaughtered by there we go. Um, the glare. There we go. That's better. All right. Thanks, Atta. That was great. And uh, I, I'm going to send you a whole bunch of additional sources um, from my years of squirreling things away. But I wanted to say that one of the things you might want to consider, um, or that we actually all of us might want to consider um, in these kinds of conversations, is how the archive is not actually, you know, whatever we consider to be the archive is probably for most people working with records on this continent, not becoming a more coherent exercise, but becoming a less coherent exercise. So that I imagine, I can see traces of what you're speaking about in stuff that I looked at, um, you know, sometime you know, back before, no, if I say back before the Rinderpest, the historians will get really cross with me. Um, but a long, long time ago in the mid 1990s. And it seems to me that many of the archives that I visited then are no longer in the same state that they were then. In fact, then they were more coherent and, and the narrative was clearer and it was much easier to follow than it is now for a variety of reasons, many of which have to do with the way in which um, our archives, um, such as they are, are being preserved. So on the one hand, when you're talking um, about um, measuring up these fragments to your archive, I mean, me measuring up the fragments of the archive um, to, to um, 
the archive's inability to deliver on the story of the whole. The ability of the archive to deliver on whatever that story was, in fact, is a very dated concept because the archive is no longer delivering in the same way. Um, and it's, I mean, I'm just thinking of this now as you've spoken. Um, so thanks again. Um, uh, sorry, isn't there a joke here about a bird? That's not um, an albatross, that's a cormorant or something. Um, uh, thanks very much for a very interesting paper and watch out in your inbox. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so last question and then I think we'll have to try to pull things together. Pamela. Can you unmute him? You would think I would learn to do that by now, right? Okay. Um, hi, Atambila. I love the work. So I want you to embrace the chaos fully. Um, I just had some suggestions, ideas to think through. I mean, I think you really do have an archive. It's these multiple archives that are, I think you use the word accidental um, juxtaposition. I mean, you're pulling together an archive that is from the newspapers, that is from the death notices, that is from the photographs, that's from the footnotes, um, the graveyards. I mean, you have a ton of stuff you're working through. So I, I feel like it's not necessarily a pro it's a project about detective work, but it's also the detective work, not only going to the past, but within all these archives. So I also want to follow up on the pieces because I work on sort of, um, a, you know, a studio photographer in Zanzibar from the mid, um, mid 20th century. And there's so much work going, you know, done on studios. Um, and, you know, I wanted you just to think about the work of Liam Buckley in particular. Um, and the, I, like I've taken his work and used the word of pose to think about poise. Um, you know, what does it mean to imagine that sitter? And I think you really have to go a lot more experimental to, to make this work fill out because you have, a, you have, a, I mean, I'm just struck. I haven't read the paper fully, but I just kind of looked at it briefly. Um, you have so much information. I mean, you have a lot you already are contending with. Um, and I was struck by a couple things. One is, you know, maybe there's a really creative way of reading the pages. Um, and the power dynamics of the page itself and the fonting, the fonts, history of fonts, um, where these girls are listed, how they're listed. Um, there's so much on the, um, the page itself. And I was thinking uh, one of my old advisors from graduate school was this guy Brinkley Messick. And he, it's called The Calligraphic State. And it's a book about reading the page um, and that what that page reads for di the power dynamics. Um, and the spacing of things and all that. So there's there's so much you can do with what you have that I'm hesitant to say you need to add more on. Obviously you're gonna do more, but there's just so much there that I think it lends itself to being a really creative project because I think that's the only way you can do justice to what you have. Um, and then I wanted to just suggest the name of Aung Sang Ho in his book, um, an anthropologist, Aung Sang Ho, Graves of Tarim, and he reads, it's about a diaspora, the Hadrami diaspora out of Yemen and the lost diaspora in some ways. And so the way to access them is through reading gravestones and reading naming. I mean, and the politics of naming, I think is a huge part of this project because you have the names. And I think there's a lot of interesting literature on the politics of naming itself. And I think someone mentioned in the chat, you know, going back to those schools and how they chose the names or they didn't name them and what names they chose and what those names signify or mean. Um, by the powers that, that be and how people are contesting those names, if they are, in fact. So I just think there's a lot more you can do with what you have and just to embrace that chaos. So I think it's a great project. So. Thank you. So, um, Atibile, you know, I don't, I don't think we expect you to respond to every single one of those, that last bundle of questions. And in fact, there are so many comments in the chat too, which I'll forward to you, um, but go for it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess it's just to say thank you to so many of the provocations. Um, yeah, and, you know, Shireen, just picking up moving away from the virtue. And, and I think part of the embracing of the chaos is moving away from that, these kind of neat, very respectable stories about these women. And perhaps that's some of the interest in them kind of being so young and being captured in time and being so young and that there's a youthfulness that we often forget about some of these women, um, even as incredible as they were, but they were also very, very young, even as they were traveling. Um, Nafisa, I completely take your point, you know, before we read against the brain, we must read the brain. Um, and I guess the challenge of that is doing that double work. You know, you, you first reading one, I don't know, it's not a double work, I'm not um, explaining it very well, but there's what there is and then how to read it. and the 
the tension between the two for me and which work is it that um, I really want to do and also just the integrity of what it is that we find and not being too quick to to um, read between the lines when all you have is actually right in front of you um, and you're yeah to the point of that there is so much there already and um, yes Thank you. <laughs> I, I do take your point to being more confident about what it is that I find. Definitely. Um, Natasha, thank you so much. Looking forward to what you're going to send. And yeah, it, it is this thing of the archive is not one thing at any given time. So even if I go back to the same archive that I visited two years ago when I began this, I think I'm going to see something in the exact same um, documents that I looked at then, especially with this conversation in mind. Um, and Pamela, please, if You've got time just before you leave. Write down some of those references. I didn't catch all the names, um, just so we can um, lots that I, I I can come back to. And yeah, I just really appreciate the generosity. Um, I was so reluctant to send Stephen even just the snippet of what I have, and I thought, ah, let me just let it go. So thanks everyone for being so um, engaging. Thank you, Atibile. I think you can see that uh, from especially from the chats and the questions that uh, it's a very interesting project. All power to you. I think many of our postgrads who are also battling with uh, terrain where there's, you know, uneven ego documentation, shall we say, um, will have found this very stimulating and useful. So thank you very much to you, and thank you for everyone for joining us. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye bye. Cheers, everyone. Thanks.